The September meeting of the Urbana Free Library Board of Trustees will come to order. Uh, roll call. Becky? Jane Williams? Here. Aaron Merritt? Here. Jeff Bain? Here. Beth Shire? Here. Chris Shearer? Here. Mark Netter? Here. Michael White? Here. Hello, Bill. Bill Brown? Here. <laughs> Here. At this time, we wish to welcome a new member to our board. And if you would administer the oath of office, I told her she had to swear at us tonight. <laughs> 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 okay, so please repeat after me. Okay, do I need to do anything? <laughs> You're fine. I do solemnly yes, swear, I do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Illinois and the Constitution of the State of Illinois and that I will faithfully discharge the, discharge the duties of the Office of Library Trustee and I will, that I will faithfully discharge the duties, duties of the Office of Library, library Trustees to the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. I know half the people in this room know Barbara, but I'm going to have her tell us about one minute of what she, who she is and what she's, what she's doing now. Okay. Well, you know, taking an oath to the Constitution actually is, is fun for me because my job at the American Library Association was supporting the First Amendment at, in the Office for Intellectual Freedom. So um, I really don't mind taking that oath. Um, and let's see. So I lived in, let's see, I lived in, Champaign-Urbana in the 60s when I was a student, and then came back to work at the library, at the UIUC library as head of special collections, and then left and went several other places, and then came back to American Library Association. Then my husband and I decided we would have to look at each other at every Ebert Fest every year, and say, you know, we love it here. Let's come back, so we're retired. And I'm just delighted to do this job. Is that enough? She and just swore she would not get involved in the community that Chris twisted her on. Chris her was. She was <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you for uh, nudging me, Chris. <laughs> uh, <laughs> are there any additional corrections to the modifications to the minutes? Seeing none, we'll move on. Agenda. Agenda. Agenda, to the agenda. Yeah. Yeah. Approval of the agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Mm -hmm. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. We have no reason to call for executive session that I know of. We move on to public comments. Do we have any public comments? We have a presentation by staff. Presentation by staff. Elaine Bearden is our first one. Alright, I'm going to try this nifty remote that I just discovered. Right, so um, Laura Figley asked me to talk about the summer reading program. She is right now, this minute, out doing outreach for the library and the community with the United Way. So, um, it's great to be here with you tonight. Uh, we had a great year for summer reading. We kicked off uh, May 21st, and um, these figures are all the way through September 7th. I think our official end was August 31st. I'm going to share um, a little bit about each program. We had summer reading for all for children, teens, and adults this summer. And um, then we'll, I'll finish up with um, sharing the sponsors of the project. Okay. So, children birth to grade five. Aren't they cute? Uh, and uh, we had 1,057 children from birth to grade five registered. This is up from last year by over 200. Um, children read or listened to books for 600 minutes, which is roughly 10 hours, to earn a free book and prizes. 51% of the kids registered completed their goal as compared to 33% from last year. We feel like we've hit the sweet spot between technology sign up and keeping track on paper and taking a few years for uh, this to find the place that we think patrons really enjoy. Um, 893 book prizes were awarded, with one young reader earning 15 books. Mm -hmm. Think about all those hours of reading. Um, 
and participants read a total of 535,800 minutes. Awesome. Right, highlights. Uh, this is the first year we reached out to local preschools and daycares, um, and three of the schools participated. They followed, um, you can see the reading log in the center. Ooh, I've got a bit of that. Uh, the, the reading log there, and every 15 minutes is a block. So the teacher would do that with the whole class, would read aloud to them 15 minutes, and then, then put a sticker or color it in. So we had 81 children from those um, schools that got um, earned free books, which was kind of exciting. Um, we also had resident jellyfish. I don't know if any of you had a chance to stop by the children's desk. We had two on the front of the desk and three, for a long time, three on the back of the desk. And it was really, uh, it lured people in and all, of all ages in conversation with the staff. So that was pretty cool. It was Mr. Stratford, Mr. Rutherford from Stratford School, who was looking at the place for his jellyfish this summer. He is a longtime patron as well. So, uh, we did also receive good media coverage. Uh, most notably, Ryan Burke from CI Living called and wanted to do a live broadcast during the Lead to the Horses. <laughs> and you can see one of the horses he was interviewing right there. Um, there were three others, and uh, it's always a fun time. Deb Murphy, who has a business called Visits with the Minis, brings those out to schools and nursing homes, and um, uh, even has, has visits at her farm. And uh, she contacted us to start this program a few years ago, and, and we always ask her back. So. And she also came with us out to Learman Garden earlier in the summer um, to uh, do more meetings. Right. Uh, teens. So uh, we had 158 teens registered for summer reading, and this is actually the same number as last summer. I looked at it twice thinking, ooh, did we just repeat the numbers? No, just this is the only number that repeated. So um, teens kept track of the number of pages they read, receiving a book prize when they reached 1,000 books, and 171 book prizes were awarded. 272,657 pages were read, and uh, teens also had the chance to review the books they read and type something online because they kept track online, um, and 227 book reviews were written. So it's kind of cool. You can see some of the uh, Comic-Con, which I'll talk about later, the, one of the events out in the uh, Cherry Alley, and then also Pokemon Go, uh, even visited the library. Really, I guess we were a couple of gyms. Uh, teams came from 69, came from Urbana Middle School, 30 from Urbana High School, 5 from University High School, 12 from the Champaign County Juvenile Detention Center, 11 from homeschooling background, and then 31 from other schools, which always include Champaign and Peter and Ritual. Um, and this, uh, the Champaign County Juvenile Detention Center has been going on for at least several years, if not more. And it involves, so our librarians are not visiting there, but they, the library there has volunteers that come and come find out about the program and then take it back to them and um, help the students log their books and so forth. And apparently they read a lot. Are all of those uh, participants, did everybody in the juvenile center participate? Yeah, I mean, a high percentage. I, I think from the stat I saw from last year, everybody participated last year, so I would assume it would be still pretty high this year. Um, and then four teens earned double-digit prizes by reading over 10,000 pages this summer. So, so much for book critics out there. Oh, and um, the photographs you see on the slide are from a project from the Teen Open Lab. They've created bee and butterfly garden that are attracting monarch butterflies. Um, there's a chrysalis out there, and they've gotten certification from Monarch Watch, the Way Station Watch Group. Um, and in, I've seen some of the monarchs at the gardens right in front of the library as well, so it's kind of cool. All right, for adults. Uh, adults kept track of books they read, so if they read four books, they got a prize. 218 were registered which was just a little higher than last year. Um, 110 completed their goal. Uh, 130 book prizes were awarded, because you could do it more than once. And 1,125 books were read. Uh, let's see. 
patrons uh, reported loving the selection of free books to choose from. And in the photo here you see on the right is the pop-up library. I don't know if you've heard about this. It happened first Friday in September uh, in front of Pizza Inn in that Curvana section where they have like tables and chairs. So Habitat Restore brought a living room full of furniture to that uh, space. And we brought the materials and folks just hung out and read and browsed and signed up for library cards and apparently some of the couches sold as well. <laughs> so it was a good, um, a good on all sizes from what I've heard. Uh, one patron even approached the Laura the next day and said it was one of the most charming events he had ever seen. <laughs> Special highlights, um, three afternoons in the park in Carl Park. Uh, were enjoyed. Um, some of our resident G DJs, uh, Joel Spencer and Brian Robertson, visited the Urbana Food Truck Rallies happening, I think, the last Tuesday of the month, or maybe it's the fourth Tuesday, um, over by the Urbana Civic Center. And so they brought the speakers and the turntable and the vinyl record collection and basically had music going the whole event. So they've done that um, four times this summer, and I think it continues in September. Um, Mary Towner worked with Clark Lindsay um, to get a lot of residents signed up for summer reading and so on and so forth. Um, and then there, the Comic Con, which was a miniature size uh, conference um, of what happens nationally in like droves of people, um, happened on Saturday, or excuse me, Saturday, August 13th. And you can see the the culminating event was a uh, movie in UC Lots. You can see somebody setting up the screen and the sound. There were 275 people that showed up for the movie. Um, That's pretty exciting. Uh, and 500, oh, it says 550 participants total in that Comic Con, which had events for all ages. Okay, so we had 195 programs in 110 days. It's kind of doing a lot of programming myself. I was like, okay, that's why we're that's why we retired this one. Um, so it, it included like we, we go to the Jetty Rose Neighborhood Day, ask what's your favorite book and movie, and you can see someone has written Frozen, someone else to kill a mockingbird. So all different ages and interests um, showed up. The jellyfish are in the bottom right there. It's a moon jellyfish. Um, the ones we had didn't stay, but if you met it in the ocean, it would. So, and then Mr. Stevens, who was part of our kickoff, is up in the upper right, um, teaching a young uh, girl how to play the guitar. Group of patrons. So that um, that statistics means we had 1.7 programs a day. Sorry. Um, we were also at Barnes and Noble for a Harry Potter release party there. So that meant we had 7,107 people at our programs this summer. You can see up in the upper left, that was part of the kickoff. Our librarian, Susan Peters, uh, showed up as an astronaut from, Park, from Parkland College. Um, the horses. We've got these uh, Kiva blocks in the department. If you haven't mastered these Kiva blocks, I would recommend um, come down with a little person or just yourself. They're amazing what you can make with And they had a speed drawing contest, which is what you see the little show <coughs> speed drawings right there. So we couldn't do this without support for the community. So we had a lot of sponsors, um, places like Bob Evans, and you see the whole list of the co-op, Courier Cafe, Curtis Orchard, Dairy Queen, Dr. G's, um, Meatheads, Noodles and Company, Old Chicago Pizza, Piatto, Hut Zone, Urbana Park District and Walmart all offer coupons for um, kids, so we give them out as part of the prizes. Um, Larry and Margaret Job uh, sponsored the kickoff party. Um, Peggy and Bob Podlesak funded the Comic Con. And Myers uh, provides money, we buy a bunch of prizes and we can put something out of the prize box, kind of like a treasure box, and we finish and show this product. And a special thank you to the Friends of the Urbana Free Library who funded 1,194 book prizes. Thrilled with that. So, any questions? Yeah. Um, are the book reviews that the middle school students wrote are they available online? They they are online. I don't know if the public can see them or not. We can find that out and let you know. Because so, it would be very interesting to see them. So, 
And they, they can choose whether to publish it or not, but I think some, a lot of them choose. How many staff are involved in this? Oh, goodness. Well, in the uh, downstairs we have two full time and three part time salary, plus we have a lot of hourly people that help out. And then upstairs they would have Joel and Lauren do most of the team programming. And then Cassia and Mary and Carol do a lot of the adult programming. A lot of staff. 10 or 12. Yeah. Good circulation staff, for example, also go to read in the market. Mm -hmm. So, right. Yeah. right. It's all hands on deck in the summer. Yes. Oh, I'm gonna lose this. Oh, I'll get it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Okay, next up is a director with a annual report. The final, I take that, right? The final annual report. This yes. Is what, yeah. this, so you have in your packets the ITLAR, which is what we submitted to the state, what Kathy submitted to the state, the Illinois Public Library annual report. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about all the fun stuff. You also have what we gave to the city, the final version, once we had the information. And so you have that in your packet as well, and that's what I presented earlier, earlier in the month. I'm going to do something similar to Elaine did to talk about the year of review for things the library highlights some trends. And last year I talked a long time because there's so much exciting stuff. It's very exciting this year too, but I'll talk a lot. Last year more time for questions and interaction. So let me close this one. Kathy is, you know, a great photographer, and this is what she took. And it really shows the hard work of Simon and other volunteers that Eleanor is helping to supervise, our garden volunteers. And they really keep the library looking spiffy, and I just love that picture, because we know how much work goes behind keeping the library looking great. Okay, so circulation is up this year. This is really exciting for us. You, the board, did some really good work to do some increasing of circulation. We all sit around and think, what are the different ways we can increase the use of the library by our patrons? So we look at what are the kinds of items they like to check out, and we evaluate where we're spending our money. If graphic novels, if graphic novels are really popular, buy more graphic novels. Where are there holes in the collection? But you did some really important things this past year by changing some of our policies to make it easier for people to check out. And one thing that you did is increase the number of renewals that people could have if no one else was waiting for items on hold. So here's some information that breaks down what this 847,000 items is about. Over 218,000 books were checked out, which is an increase of 13% of book checkouts, which we think is really great. Um, partly we think because kids are reading 1,000 books with 1,000 books before kindergarten program, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and summer reading, uh, we think that, that that is an impetus behind some of this. Downloadable books were really popular last year. Circulation increased by 67%, so we had 37,000, over 37,000 checkouts of ebooks. So, you know, this year, seeing this information, Laura's already asked for, in this budget amendment, money to come from music CDs for adults, which wasn't as popular, and decreased to increasing money able to put into ebooks. So, almost 4.5% of the library's total SERP was ebook SERP. So, that is something that we're definitely keeping an eye on and again, increasing availability to our patrons who are very interested in it. We also have streaming music, which was popular as well. Um, checkouts, over 28% of our checkouts were patron-initiated renewals, with over 242,000, looking at 847,000. 242,000 uh, of those were patron-initiated renewals. So you raising the re renewal limit from three to five made a difference for people who wanted to renew. Also, what we're trying to do, again, is look at the different ways we can make things more accessible. One of the ways is buying collections. One of the ways is making the collections we have physically more accessible. So you've noticed that on the second floor, we've been converting the DVDs from behind the desk checkout 
to being out on the floor, and we saw a big increase. The nonfiction DVD collection, which is really rich and deep, that circulation increased 11% last year. And the collection is not completely on the floor. We expect it to increase even more this year. So we're very pleased that our patrons seem to be happy with the number of things we're doing to make the library more accessible to them. So today, checked out today, Dawn checked. We've got 26,551 items checked out, worth $516,000. Except it's actually worth even more because there's over 600 ebooks in there. We don't actually have a number on, on a case. It's almost 700 ebooks checked out. We don't have a price for those because we buy them as a package. But if you were to include those in there, the number would be higher as well. So that's a lot of items to be checked out today. So we're very pleased that people are happy. This is going to be a slide about some trends. This is about patron-initiated circulation, which we're going to talk a little bit more about. What I can tell you here is here you can see how renewals have increased over the past three years. We had two renewals, and you increased it to three. And you can see that jump went from three renewals to five. So you can look at a percentage of total CERC to where that orange block is, and a big part of our CERC is renewals. The little gray box is so total self-check. There was no self-check, and then in 2014, the self-check started in April. So this is not a whole year, it's just April, May, June. You can see last fiscal year went to 114,000 items, and this year, 157,000 items were um, checked out at the self-checks. And that may or may not include renewals, but again, that gray bar is increasing every year. And then downloadable, so you can see there, there weren't any. 22,000, 37,000. So we do take a look at these trends and use them to help uh, work, look at workflow and purchasing and seeing where patrons, patron interests are. This is a graph that shows you patron-initiated and staff-initiated circulation with renewals going up, with self-check going up, and with ebook checkout going up. This is the first year we've seen that more patron checkouts occurred initiated by patrons than staff checkouts. So again, it is a trend. We still only have about 25% ebook plus self-check checkout. Um, as far as self-check. So if you include the ebooks and everything else, this is where we see the line, and we expect this trend to continue. We still, we still will be staffing the circulation desk. There's a lot that happens that's not checkout. And people still want um, the personal touch, which we will continue to provide it. So some new collections, people were excited about some of the new things we offered them to be able to check out. This year we circulated uh, vinyl LPs and records. We've got 200, over 200 records and two LP players, which have been, I've seen them on the shelf once since they came out last fall. One record player once. Otherwise they're checked out all the time. And down here we have an example of, and we've talked about these a million times because they're so exciting, the hands-on science and math kits. So we got a grant with the WILL and PBS that helped fund the math kits. And a generous grant from Brock Rosenshine helped pay for the hands-on literacy reading kits. We've got about 65, 75 of them. And you may see 10 or 12 on the shelf. They're frequently checked out and very popular with patrons. Programming has been something we've been stressing. I know it's a personal interest of Chris and something he's asked us to really consider as a person as well as a board member. And you can see our program, programming is going, uh, growing, growing, and growing. We had 31,800 people attend programs this year. That's a 6% increase over last year, which is great. You'll find the library at the Sweet Corn Festival. You'll find us at the Food Truck Rally Monthly. Of course, we are at Read at the Market. We added a couple of big, uh, big events. There's a Star Wars event in the fall, Star Wars Reads. We did programming for that, which was really great. And then we also participated in the fan-based Star Wars event that happens May 4th. May the 4th be with you. And so we have two Star Wars events a year, and those are really fun. And Reading to the Horses, and of course, our ever, ever popular fairy tale ball. So we also had our first ever Lego event, Lego Palooza. We had a number of people build Lego structures and um, pieces and bring them in here for a judging, and then the family that won the All Ages, they had this huge, huge tower with all kinds of different levels, and it was on display in the children's department for a long time, and had a lot of people very interested in it. So the Town and Gun series, a partnership with the Champaign County Historical Archives and the Archives for Student Life. Yes. 
Like she didn't say I was wrong, so that's right. So they had their second year of programming, which is a really great partnership as well. And as Elaine was mentioning, not only do we go to the Learn and Garden by invitation to help issue library cards to people this year, um, just after the fiscal year ended, but we brought the horses at their request. And that was a really great thing. There was a little boy who, as the minivan was pulling up, was pulling off his seatbelt, like opening the door to run out and go read to the horses. I mean, it was really a special, a special thing to see. So you saw Elaine, and this is Rachel and Lynn as well. One thing that they do is get the heck out into the community and talk to people. So this was them gearing up to talk about summer reading. This was their Read for the Rin um, shtick that they do. Every year they come up with a new skit. They take it to the schools, preschools, daycare schools, uh, public schools, and they really have a great time. We have board members. I have pictures of a number of you at the Read for the Market, and um, Beth was kind enough to let me take her picture. We appreciate how you as the board are out in the community representing the library in different ways and letting us take corny pictures of you. But we know you spend time talking to people and really getting the word out about what we can do and then bringing that information back to us so we can make good decision. You passed a number of policies. The library's infrastructure is much stronger this year than it was a couple of years back. We'll continue to create a good working environment and an environment for our patients to come in and use where people understand what the rules are and that we can be consistent. Anka and a team of people launched the staff handbook last fall. It had been since 1998 since it had been updated and it took a year of work of Anka and a team of people to really take the book apart and start from scratch so that our staff had a very comprehensive look at um, working environment at the library and we're very pleased that they are already working on version two which is coming out. More infrastructure work that we did this year. We've cross-trained more of the circulation staff who are interested to be information assistants. They work um, on all three levels on reference desks answering reference questions with other library staff members with the librarians. They exclusive, um, not exclusively, they work independently on the first floor reference desk. They are notaries public they do a really fantastic job with Reader's Advisory and they're working on the second floor again in the computer lab as well as doing children's reference as well with our other library staff. So um, people tend to Hello. like it. It um, mixes up the Hello. day with some circulation work and some reference style work. What is also great about this is they brought their circulation experience to them and there have been a number of times when, for example, in children's, a, a, a patron is wanting to use a self-check or something and has circulation questions the circulation information assistant has been able to jump right in and answer the question of the patron on the spot, which is leading us to look at what are the things that we could train non-circulation staff at the different desks to do to provide better customer service. What are some simple things? And we've already started implementing some of those. So like address checks. If you can look and see that the person lives in the same address, then you can go ahead and set that moving for the patron to be able to use the library at the spot, as opposed to having to leave the floor, go to the surf desk, then come back. So again, trying to serve our patrons in the best way possible in many different ways. Also thinking about outreach, a number of staff were asked to speak at different um, places. Anka had engagements, Sherry Bowser and Archives had a speaking engagement, Kathy had, was invited to do speaking, I spoke a couple times to Legal Women Voters and to Bob Berger's management class. Um, MC also spoke at the library school. So, Staff are in high demand here. The library's doing really great things and people want to hear about it and we're excited to participate in our community at large. So here's just a little bit more information. A Thousand Books Before Kindergarten launched in 2015. We continue to do outreach to individuals as well as preschools and daycare centers. This is something that's gonna have a long tail. We had a strong start and we're looking to encourage more people to participate. Been talking to Aaron um, Alderman Aaron Ammons, and we were talking about different ways to reach out to people that he knows in daycare centers and preschools and stuff to provide, again, more, more access to the kids. And like, like what Elaine showed you with the sheet for kids to participate in summer reading all at once, we can do that with a thousand books before kindergarten too, so kids have success together. You know they're getting read to at the preschools and daycare centers, so why not pull that together and make it easy for people? We want them to have success. but. There are so many cute little kids and they're so proud. They're so proud of the reading, but they read a lot. These parents are reading a lot of books and caregivers. They are really spending some time, quality time with books with their kids. And we love that. Oop. There we go. 
So the Teen Open Lab, now the Teen Open Lab in this fiscal year we're in right now, 2017, just passed 10,000 students from when it started in 2013 in the spring. But within the fiscal year we're talking about, they passed 9,000 students. So they're really gaining momentum, and they had momentum before. We're very pleased to see how many teens are excited about this. We're seeing younger kids come in, given the work that Joel and our new librarian, Lauren, are doing, reaching out to the middle school and to other places where kids, kids go to bring them in. They started the pollinator garden at the request of, um, at the request of one of the teens, a couple of the teens, and that's across the street to south of us. And then, we, again, we had hired the new teen librarian. So we had 32, almost 3,300 students come to participate in the teen over that last fiscal year. As we mentioned, we had jellyfish, which was a lot of fun. We're always looking for new ways to reach out into the community and provide people and organizations a way to interact with our patrons if we think our patrons would like that and that everyone would benefit, and having the jellyfish here certainly was a benefit to everyone. The food truck rally's been really great. Um, Sweet Corn Festival, we had a partnership uh, opportunity with the Sister City program. We helped fund the storyteller Mama Edie to come down from Chicago and focus in on uh, African American folk tales and stories, which was really well attended. I'm glad to partner with their Sister Cities. So talking about grants and different opportunities and partnering, I've got a couple things here from Anka I want to read that talk about some of the great opportunities she participated in. So over a period of two years, the Illinois Library, with an INLS grant, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, they developed a preservation self-assessment program, a PSAP. So this was a web application that helped address evaluation and prioritizing preservation needs among collection materials found in library special collections. So that's one thing that Anka participated in. And so here are the different partners that worked on this as, um, as this group. The Chicago History Museum, the Heritage Preservation, the Illinois Heritage Association, the Illinois State Library, the McLean County Museum of History and the Spurlock Museum, and the Urbana Free Library with Anka working on this. So those are really well respected institutions, and I'm very pleased that we were represented so well as, as on that um, project, on that grant. Also, Illinois represented our library in the Illinois program for research in the humanities. So there's a public history and student research cluster, and they focus on new directions in the field of public history. So what are they looking at? They're exploring, documenting, and promoting hidden and forgotten stories and persons connected to our campus and the wider Champaign-Urbana community. They've got a blog, and this is a flyer from one of the events that they had recently in April, which was quite popular. And they had people in from all over to, to learn from what the work is that's being done here. This work was done in part with a grant, so we're very happy with that. Carol Insteep is great at writing grants. She wrote some letters of support for Urbana Arts Grants. Um, three were awarded, one of which was done during last fiscal year, which is this gentleman, Bernard, Bernard Woma, who was in from Africa, and you heard him one night because you had a board meeting the same evening, and he was phenomenal. Also mentioning grants, the Ready to Learn Initiative grant was from PBIS, sorry, PBS and Will. And you saw that earlier. Oops, oh, I missed the archives. So one of the biggest things that happened this year is the archives of the Chinook Air Force Base Museum came to the library and are physically located here and next door in the Tepper building. So again, we'll just mention they've got blueprints and maps for the Chinook Air Force Base, publications, oral histories, aerial photographs, subject files, photographs, scrapbooks, and over 200 videotapes, and then extensive archival donations. So we are very thrilled to have this opportunity to be the home, the, the, the long-term home of this collection, and to take the years that it will take to really make it accessible to our community. So there's another look at shot of the library. Here's what's up next for us. This year that we're in right now, we're looking at, of course, as you're well aware, capital expenses and physical plant concerns, looking at HVAC, porch windows, um, Ten years down the road from now, we're going to be thinking about the roof. So we're thinking about what we know we need to work on now, 
our bidding's coming later too, and then what we need to bring to as far as capital expenditures for the future. We started a couple of new collections last year, the records, the record players, the literacy kits. We've got more coming this year that have already been purchased. We're gonna start processing them. So things like music tools, guitars, and amps so people can fiddle around and learn and explore themselves. We have productivity tools such as DVD, or VHS to DVD converter so people can, can transfer their materials so they have better access to them. We have a, a whole bunch of hands-on science tools purchased with money from Glenn Spitzi that the foundation has kept in trust. So things like globes, such as a globe of Mars or a globe of the moon. We've got uh, telescopes, microscopes, things that are gonna let people engage in science in a new way. And we're very pleased to start rolling these out later this year. Do I interrupt now or at the end? I? I've got just a couple more lines, so we can talk now or later. Oh, go ahead. Okay. So the state budget is still not completely set. That is a challenge. It's set through the end of this year, but last year we received $20,000 less than it originally told that we would. We budgeted for even less this year, but who knows what will happen with the state budget. So just keeping our eye on that, just so you know we're keeping our eye on that. More big programming is coming our way. Elaine mentioned the Comic-Con. We had 550 people attend. We will continue on with the Star Wars program, Spirit Tale Ball, looking at the things that our patrons like and continue new programs that might be smaller and grow, and then people that the continued favorites of these large events. We're going to start a long-range planning process. We're going to continue the CD and DVD conversion to get the materials out on the floor. More shelving coming up in the circulation area of the floor soon. And then, again, looking to be hiring a development director to help pay for some of these great things that we're looking at to provide stability for the libraries we go into the future. Any questions? Yeah, I, I have a question about maker spaces. A lot of what yeah. we talk about is is could conceivably be in a maker space. And mm -hmm. I wondered what your plans are, if any, to do a maker space. You know, we do a pop-up maker space, and okay. we can tell you more about yeah, that. Yeah, please do. That'd be great. It, um, that's the team open lab I was mentioning. Okay. For the ten thousand kids. Okay. But here's the deal, adults want to use the stuff too. And so we are currently evaluating what it would look like to buy, for example, a 3D printer to put on the second floor reference desk okay. or something like that. So how can we use the technologies we have in different ways to make them more accessible? And there's there are questions to be answered about that. But we're working on it, thank you. Your, your e-books you couldn't account for, are they checked out? beyond our, your checkout system, I, you said you couldn't account for them. I cannot account for their price. So we buy the e-books as a, a yeah. one thing we subscribe to is a package, so it gives us access to thousands and thousands of e-books for one price. Other e-books we buy individually. So we can tell you how many are checked out right now, but I don't have a way to map those items to the cost. But I could tell you later how much I spend in a year on e-books, that I could tell you. Just not right this second. Are, we, we don't know what's being used really then, do we? I they do. check out the big bulk, and you don't know which one they handpicked inside that. I Where's can that? tell you which, of the big bulk, I can tell you which of those are checked out. But some of them I can't break down per price. So if, if we get 10,000 books for a $12,000 year subscription, you can average it, but that's not really how the prices are determined. It's a tricky thing about ebooks. There's a, there's a lot of tricky things about the way ebooks are managed, and they're not consistent from different vendors. Uh, is our team lab continuing to be funded? Well, we pay for staffing, and the as far as I know, the makerspace is still continuing to provide us, for example, filament for the uh, 3D printer. So sometimes we buy supplies, but frequently they purchase supplies. And we actually just applied for a grant to Fingers crossed to get another couple of 3D printers. We'll see what happens with that. Does that answer your question, Chris? Yeah. Okay. And grants, would you have an idea, a ballpark, how many total dollars we've gotten in grants this year? No, but I can get that number for you because I don't remember, I don't remember how much money came in from the PBS grant. Um, one of the grants that Anka worked on was $2,500 for this the grant that was over here with our, our um, 
hidden stories and bringing them forward. And then the IMLS grant was very large, and I, I don't have a number for that right now, but I can, I can get you that number. But we really could use that to offset our deficit income that we got grants in place of. <laughs> Not really, but we, it certainly helped our budget. We participated in grants, but we probably wouldn't have done some of those other things without the grants. So that wouldn't have been an offset in that file. So that but a dollar value, I think, would be important to know, don't you? Mm -hmm. If you might be like to know how much. Happy to get that. Other, than the, other than the current say that we come in with income and, and, and expenses, mm -hmm. we got grants, and so that's a big chunk. We also receive donations from people, which I was not speaking about. I was looking at more like outside funding bodies. So in the, I can certainly pull a number for you again for next time. I can email it to you later tomorrow about how many, um, how much was donated to the library, whether it was a request when someone passed or someone said, here's $10, you guys did a great day today. So we do receive gifts. We call them gifts. And is that coming in through the foundation? That's separate. The foundation is a separate 501c3, and they have their own budget. They also gift us money. And for example, the foundation pays for the very popular UFL Live Sunday concerts once a month. And that was around $3,000 last year. And then there's the Prairie Breezes concerts for classical, classic and other fun music for smaller children. And those happen in here, and those are Saturday mornings now. And that's funded by donations from the, the Podlastic family that also had given money for teens, and that's what paid for the Comic-Con. I guess I'd kind of like to see a whole donations by individuals, donations from the foundations, donations, and grants. I mean, I think that all adds to our budget the bottom line. For what we spent, yes. And Kathy yeah. actually puts that money in the IPLAR as far as when she looks at totals that go to the state. Okay. The state requires that we look at all the spending. Okay, that's what I think we really appreciate. And then, with this. absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, it's available in the, the reports that we have but that doesn't mean it's accessible, so let me make it accessible for you. And then, as I think about this, a lot of the ones, Chris, that you talk about, they're, a lot of it's one-time funding, and we usually budget more in a recurring funding there, so it's not going to appear in our budget, per se, until no. there's, yeah, so. No, I don't think it's a competitive budget, no. but it certainly reflects. But yeah, okay, yeah, because I think it's so just for interest to see how much it is, but it's obviously going to be a very dynamic number yeah. from year to year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be. Right. Um, I just, it, less of a question, more of a comment. Um, thinking of the presentation last year, which was very good. It was very detailed, but I think as a board, we needed all the details at that point. And I'm thinking of here we are a year later, and it's just phenomenal, the growth in programs and everything we've done this year. but. I also think you and the staff have done a really nice job highlighting things all during the course of the year. So I think it, as a board, we have a much better feel for what the library is doing on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. And so I don't, as a member, I really appreciate that. And I just can't believe how much more we've done this year. You know, the programmatic growth is, is just terrific. Keep going at five percent. We're going to be pushing them always. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a future conversation. Yeah. So not. I mean, I echo her comments, but uh, so not to be a downer here. But I, I the um, the first part where you talk about the increase in circulation, mm -hmm. maybe because I have never done that before, but I was surprised that renewals were part of your number line. Do you do a an analysis of circulation without the renewals in there? I mean, it, you know, if we're renewing now more times than we used to, that would seem like to me it would inflate your growth. It would appear, it would appear, for, to me, I would think number of books circulating would be the important statistic, but the, the amount of time they're kept wouldn't be as important as how many I mean, I, I check out a lot of books and I go to the computer and I renew them, but I, it, it shows up as though that's increased circulation. I know it's circulating and they're out there, but um, just in terms of a trend, it would seem like you should be, should be um, mitigating that effect in order to identify exactly how much 
real physical circulation or something. Yeah, you but, get what I'm saying? But then if I think of it, think if the renewal periods were shorter or not as frequent, so then a book would come back in and if it's very popular, most likely it would go right back out of with a different patron. So you, you'd want to somehow capture that too. It's, it's no, I know you need to, I yeah. think you need to capture it, but it would seem like it's a different piece of data than going to the library and getting a book and checking it out. Because perhaps I know some people that get a book out and don't read it and then they just keep renewing it. And, um, that would add to your, it would inflate your... But may I suggest, as a person who has done this herself, check out 25 books at a time, because all these cookbooks look really great. Even if I check them out originally and take them home and then bring them back later, it doesn't mean I read them the first time either. Yeah. But to answer your question, um, two things. We actually do look at the numbers of original checkouts because, again, that and checkouts and returns. So it's a staffing issue if I know how many items have to be shelved because they were returned versus all the renewals. We're not shelving them every time they come back. So we are looking at those numbers. No, I just, it just like briefly, it looked like, oh my gosh, we're more, more renewals, which translates into more circulation immediately. That didn't seem to be. But you just said it's less work. Right. Yeah. Well, so the, the IMLS, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, has guidelines about, and the state follows the guidelines, is what you need to report as circulation. And renewals are included in what we have to submit statewide. So what we give you is the number we are required to give to the state, which again goes to the federal government. So if you ever want to know what a circulation number is in a month without renewals, we can pull that. And I think renewals is part of our monthly sheet. No, self-check is, sorry. Self-check is part of the number. So we do know that we do know the numbers and we are aware, but it is it is a legitimate count of use because there's no way to know if someone would read it whether they checked it out multiple times or renewed it multiple times or not. Yeah, I think it, it's a term that uh, a measure might be uh, number of days books are off the shelves. Uh, we can't tell intent. I mean, we, we could bring a book back half read because we didn't, we didn't, we couldn't renew it too. So you know, we've all done that. We've all kept books over and over too. But then not everything's a book now. Also. Correct. A material. So, a material. Yeah. 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 Slightly okay. frivolous question. What would happen if every book that's out were brought back? Don't <laughs> <Well>, say that. <laughs> we couldn't show them all, right? Well, that's what I've heard at other libraries, and I just wonder. At, during this conversation now, I think, oh. I wonder what would happen here. I don't know the answer to that question. We're we're in a fairly full state with this library. Yeah. The more things that are actually checked out in people's homes or schools or wherever, the better for us because then we can buy more to put on the shelves that they want to check yeah. out. So in some collections, you could have, let's say, 40% of your items checked out and it's always rotating. In other collections, you don't expect that. So for example, DVDs might check out more or children's graphic novels check out a whole heck of a lot. So we can buy more for a small area because we know they won't be there. Same thing with those kits. I never see more than 10 or 15 on the shelf, and we have 65, 75. So we don't want them all to come back. I, I know that. I know that. I was just wondering how dire would it be if they did. We it would be the emotional equivalent of a 1930s run on the bank. The bank <laughs> never oh, keeps exactly. as much money as people have account books saying the bank owes them that much money. It would be very bad. We would make it work. Yeah, well, I'm sure you would. That might be an incentive to expand the building, but that's a different conversation. On the, on the kids, do classroom teachers ever come and say, I want 20 of these for my classroom? Or is it individual parents saying, I need one or two, or a group of parents have gotten together to say, we're going to work on these together, or a Girl Scout troop? All of the above, and I'm glad you mentioned teachers, because we increased access by, we keep looking at things to say, where are we putting limits that are artificial that we can control that people might want us to raise? So for teacher holds, a teacher can call up or put in a web form and say, I would like to, books on dogs. And we used to have a limit, or items, DVDs, whatever, on dogs, and we used to limit that. So I asked, and we talked, and said, how often 
is it a problem that someone asked for 25 books on dogs or whatever? And the answer is, we weren't overwhelmed with requests, and we weren't overwhelmed with people wanting 100 books on dogs that would then take all the dog books away from everyone else. So we were able to raise the limits and just work reasonably with people, and sometimes they do want kits. I haven't heard of 20 kits going out. Um, people could place holds. The schools, their school media centers all have library cards for us, so they could do that, but I haven't heard of that in particular. But yes, all those groups of people do check out the kits. So the uh, number of sort of automated checkouts has gone up a lot. There was a period a year or so ago where there were hassles with that system. Does that mean it's really running well now? Every now and again, there's a burp. But for the most part, I think it's working well. So sometimes the receipt printer won't work, or sometimes something. But generally speaking, the speeds are pretty good, so you're not waiting forever, and that it is working. It is working well. We've got the two on the main floor and two in, in the youth department, and it works. They love it. They love it on the first floor down here. It's a good question. People are frustrated they're not going to touch it. Um, on, the, on the circulation, kind of to get an honest question, since the collection is about 350,000, circulation is usually about 72,000. Would you think, is that about, so that's about 20% out most of the time? Does that sound right? Sure. 20, 20%. <laughs> so if they all come back, it increases the yeah. collection by that much, I guess. Um, also, as far as um, the circulation numbers, do, do we get numbers for unique patrons usage? Like whether, how many patrons say in the past month have used it? Check something out. I will defer to Don. We could probably run a report that would say, you know, how many, um, with the last activity, last circuit activity. So it would be close because it could also be they reviewed their card. But I think most of the time there's activity, it's, it's a checkout or a renewal kind of thing. We could probably. Could we get a monthly figure on that? And would it would be possible to historic back for a couple of years and not. Polaris doesn't always keep data, mm -hmm. so maybe, but we can look and see. It would just be interesting to see if the uh, uh, increase in circulation has also resulted in an increase in patron usage, usage or if it's been kind of the same people and just checking out more or renewing or something. Um, and then on the figures for the team up in lab, can you mention those again? You said something about 10,000 and something about 3,300 or something? Yes. Let me pull this up. So the Teen Open Lab started in March, March, April of 2013. And during this fiscal year, June 30th, as of June 30th, we had 9,300 from March, oh, from the beginning, but so last three years, in the last three years, and then this month we just hit 10,000. So in a given year, big. how many? Is it twice a week during the school year? Three times, and it's year round: Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Okay, so it's about 150 times a year. Right. That comes out to about 20, 20 people per. The average is about 25, and this past couple weeks with school just starting and the great outreach that's happening, we had 63, 59, 42. So today, was about, yeah. today was 36 or 31. Yeah. So some days, like uh, the people are on vacation, or it's really nice outside, we could have, we could have five, we could have 10. But other days, it's a lot of kids having a um, great time. I just, yeah, I think the breadth of the program is just amazing. Um, really, there's a lot of pe people, and I think it, uh, reflects a lot about the community. And I, I just saw the day that Urbana um, High School won an award um, mm -hmm. for School of Opportunity. It's like the yeah. silver one. one of, I think there were eight gold, oh, 12, 12, yeah. 12, 12 yeah. silver. Yeah. Yeah. And, the top yeah. and so it's the amazing. kind of stuff that the library is doing, I think, fits into that as far as yeah. um, being open yeah. to, you know, a variety of income levels and education levels and, and Really, do taking a kind of evidence-based approach to things, and, and uh, I, I think it's 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 
it's a good kind of coexistence with the high school, and I think we're doing it. I, I hope we're doing it right, but it seems like uh, if they're getting an award, maybe we are doing something right because I think we do work together. Yeah. Um, I think that was it. Oh, um, just. I thought of something else about the detention center. Do they do they actually check out our books, or do they have their own library and we, we discount the books that they read in their library? They have their own library, okay. and I think you might remember last year when Joel Coyle came and talked for two years back. He mm -hmm. talked about it. Some of the books that the kids won from participating were the first books the kids had ever owned. Mm -hmm. So it's really a great partnership. And when we looked at a um, on average student reading, so how many pages each kid read from each of the different schools. There were only so many um, students at the juvenile detention center, but they were reading double the number of pages as some of the other kids at the other locations. So that was really, it was great for us to see how things were being used, and they, they were voracious readers. So we're really glad. Just we, we offered to partner with them in different ways. We've offered to bring teen open lab stuff to them, but they have different restrictions. So we'll yeah. keep thinking of ways that make sense to us and offering different opportunities. And one day, a different opportunity will fit. Summer reading is working. So we'll just keep trying to serve those kids as best we can. Do and we're they have a specialist the or somebody that's, that's working with them in the detention center? Okay. I guess I'm thinking there's probably some of these kids who really can't read very well. And just to say you've got a book doesn't say they are able to get through it. Mm -hmm. Are there, is there help there? It is my understanding that they receive education while they're there. I don't know about all the things, but... It, it might be part of the education program, but I'm not sure. I can get you more information about it. Because I think it's fabulous that they're working with them. Yeah. Right. If we get into statistics tonight, I think as you talk about the breadth of program, and there's a couple of things, I, numbers I'd like to have, I didn't mention either, but I'm wondering if it would make sense to vote some time at a future meeting. So look at the numbers and statistics we generate. See if there's if there's an interest in different, in more or or fewer. Would there be? I mean, I, we just asked about uh, grants. Well, if we do not get into fundraising, we're going to need to have a whole set of yeah. mm -hmm. uh, numbers relating to fundraising. The only thing I would say is that I I'd hope we could come up with uh, the data that. You're already collecting for the state or for the federal government. Yeah. So it's not, you know, so we don't start start some consistency right. and not apples and oranges. Yeah. 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 And we also don't want to start quite well with blue chips either. Exactly. Yeah. They have better things to do than to do for us. But still, if there's, if there's yeah, numbers, no, I, I you know, need yeah. more numbers yeah. to, to do your job. Yeah. We, we at least ought to be able to talk about it. Yeah. And one thing that will be easier soon when the city has the new financial system. So, mm -hmm. for example, I mentioned the, the data about finances that we have is. It's available, but it's not always easy to see. With the new financial system, we'll be able to pull things into Excel and flip them around and have canned reports that just go boom versus a much more manual process now. So again, if there are things you're looking for, happy to provide them. I've got another financial thing coming your way to talk about how money flows next month to just show you. But if we talk about numbers, maybe we want to do it in conjunction with the adoption of the new system too. We have more capability, different capabilities. That'll still be 12 to 18 months out. So if right. you have needs now, please ask now. But know that more will come and it will be easier in the future. Good. So um, we have this program at Wiley, and I think it's at another couple of the elementary schools called the Book Exchange. Mm -hmm. People donate books, parents mm -hmm. and whatnot. They go into a room, the kids come in you know, during the class periods for like 10, 15 minutes or so, each class comes in and they get to take a couple of books. And then the, the idea is you can bring a book back and get another book, but they're your books. You don't check them out, nobody controls them, nobody catalogs them. Um, and if you want to, if you don't have a book to bring back, you pay a quarter and you buy it. So it kind of gives the sense that the book means more than just here's a free book. And then I was reading about some study in Europe where they corrected for education, you know, these education mm -hmm. studies where the people in Denmark are so far ahead. If they correct for, you know, poverty level or whatever, and the one indicator they used that seemed to work fine is if they took people out of the sample that said they had no books at home or a few books at home, all of a sudden things leveled up. So a lot of it, I think, is trying to get books into the home, but not necessarily library books because our librarian is always like, well, you can't check out a book because you haven't returned the other ones, you know. So this 
book exchange is a way to get free books, but but with some worth to them, so they don't feel like it's just a freebie. Um, so they're very successful to the point where they're shipping books to other locations, but they can't keep the program going because there's not enough people to come and staff the thing all day long and da 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 da. But when you talk to Aaron Am Amons, there may be some way that you could. I mean, they're kids' books. There's lots of them. People donate them. There may be some way to do, to to do that so it's not your circulation that gets books into homes of kids that wouldn't normally have books. I mean, it might work yeah. for the library rather than just in the schools. And, sorry, it was just an idea. We love the idea of putting books in the hands of people of all ages. We are all on board for all the different initiatives. And I was listening to the radio the other day and hearing about that Will has got literacy initiatives and kids get books and people volunteer to be mentors. And I thought, well, we need to be promoting this. We, we are promoting this. I just didn't know it. But, I find so, a lot of people are afraid of the library. You know, there's so many kids. You can't get a book today because you didn't pay for that one that you lost last year kind of thing, and this gets around them. So, yes to what you're saying. So here are a couple of things that we're doing. We are, we've got our fingers out in many pies. One thing that Bill's been passionate about is, if that's not too strong a word, getting cards in the hands of kids that don't qualify for cards because they're non-residents given that they don't pay their bad taxes. So we are working actively, we've talked about this, with the public schools on a memorandum of understanding or intergovernmental agreement. And we just have to show the value that they're providing us and the value we're providing them. So we're working with the city attorney and we will be working with them. So part of the question is how do you get books in the hands of kids? Partly it's maybe expanding who can get a card. Then you get into the issue of who can't use their card because they have fines. So other libraries have addressed this in different ways, and it's something that we've also started looking at. And there are monetary things that need to be discussed. Do you do uh, an amnesty where you waive everyone's fees? Do you have people volunteer at the library to work off their fees? Do you have people read to take down their fees? Do you not want to associate reading as a pleasure with working off fees that your mom got because she used your card and checked out DVDs more shortly? So there are a lot of complicating factors, and this is actually a place where we've talked to staff and said, what we want to look at are what other libraries have done and what is the data they can share with us. So every community is different, but if, you know, read off your fines things, put a bad taste in everyone's mouth, which I'm not saying they do, but if that is something that just isn't successful, we don't want to do that. So we're looking at different ways to get cards in the hands of people appropriately, legally with the state laws, and then looking at how we can help people that have got some barriers in the way to using the cards. Also, we now are going to have a little free library. And next week, Thursday, where there's going to be a dedication over at the Pollinator Garden across the street. The Friends of the Library sponsoring a little free library. And we will be able to put books out there, and it's a give a book, take a book. So there's not, there's not a spot for a quarter, but there can be a book exchange. And something that was really important to the Friends was that there be youth books there so that kids could get books in there. So we're looking at this as a multifaceted approach, and it's going to take time. And the needs here are great. The literacy needs in our community are great. But if we keep moving forward in the different directions, we feel confident that we'll continue to make a difference that we're, we're seeing already. So I love the idea. I'd like to talk with you more about that, because if we can be part of part of it, that, that might work out brilliantly for everyone. Um, the public health district also gives away books. Um, from us. A lot of different places, but anybody that comes in through the WIP program or something like that, there's free books in the lobby that kids get to take. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we're thinking about. Can we, what are all the secret little places? Or so they're not secret because we know we give the books, but can we put something together for people who might be looking for books for their kids or their students? What can we do to help make it clear what our opportunities are? Because we're the information place. We should make it easy. And I think we can say that the book sales, any of the books that are the children's books that are still good, mm -hmm. do go out. And those are the giveaways, many times, from the book sale that are still usable. What's our Spanish book publishing look like for children? We have one, and I, I have statistics. I could, if you want data, I could give it to you now, we can talk later. Yeah, I do. Spanish, but yeah. the Spanish would be a big one. That's the last question, or second last question, or whatever. I can. We'll have more questions. I 
love questions. So we have 25 Spanish and adult fiction books. We have children's. They might be mixed in. I don't see them pulled out separately. Are the Spanish language books integrated with the English titles? I thought they weren't, so that's why I will have to take a better look. But 105 adult Spanish fiction books, 25 youth adult fiction books, young adult fiction books, and then I'm not seeing Spanish pull out, so I'll just step back. But I can get you a number on that because we have them. Yeah, well, the, I guess where I'm going with it is, is, is <clears throat> there's all sorts of impediments to it. You can, you can put books in the house, in the home, but if there's somebody who can't read them, you know, well, there's another problem you can't yeah. solve. Mm -hmm. you know, we try to refer, refer people to adult, adult, adult ed program. Mm -hmm. Yes, no problems. But, uh, so I guess I think you, you said 25 children's books. I don't think that's unfair to me. No, that's, mm -hmm. there's not as many teens. Those don't check out as well. So again, we look I'm at sure they it. don't check out as well. Mm -hmm. okay, that's not a reason not to have it. Fridays, right? Free tech support is not true. Yes. You like that topic? <laughs> You're right. It is, it is, it's One hour a week. You're good, Bill. Okay. We'll go on from the discussion about literacy to talking about library cards. September is National Library Card Sign Up Month. And when I've been working with Don and working with Laura to talk about different ways that we can increase the number of library card holders that we have in Urbana. I, I think it's, um, we, when we looked at our numbers, there are many people in Urbana who are eligible for a library card. Um, they pay for the service through the taxes, but they don't have a library card. So what are the ways that we can go out into the community? And we looked at this month, because it is um, a national um, month through the American Library Association that focuses in on getting a library card. But we tried, we decided that this, this presentation I have here, we're celebrating National Library Card Month, but we're actually going to make it more sustainable by going, continuing on to make it a goal of ours to go and increase the number of card holders in the community. So one of the first things we did was we started looking at a message, and I'm probably in everybody's way here. Um, we started looking at a message that we wanted to present to the public. And um, we wanted to talk about getting a library card, but then we wanted to talk about the things that you could do to discover with your library card. And so we uh, created through with graphics uh, a message that was get your library card and you can discover, you can explore, you can connect, you can create, you can imagine, you can read. And this is something that you'll see on our um, public catalog. Uh, the mayor has issued a proclamation, proclamation that it's National Library, it's Library Card Sign Up Month in Urbana. And then also, you may have noticed when we were coming in, there is now a banner um, on the front of the building. Uh, what we have learned from doing book sales is that is the best promotional tool for the book sales is the banner outside the library. So we decided to take it another notch with this, and we can leave that out for a couple of months now, until we still know better, until the book set comes up again. So we're trying this approach, and we wanted something bright, and graphics accomplished that very well. We're very happy with the colors. I'm going to talk about some of the things that we've decided. We have uh, talked about ways that we could reach out into the community to, or bring in our programming here, and how we can reach out into the community, and to, um, talk to people about getting a library card. And um, we have some of the things that we do every single month. For example, read at the market. We have done that uh, every, I can't remember what is it, the fourth? Uh, 
fourth Saturday of the month where we go out and there's Carol at the upper left hand corner. She's reading to somebody on our magic reading carpet as we call it. Elaine talked about the Urbana food truck rally where we're going out in August. Um, both Joel and Brian have been going out promoting the vinyl collection, but we're now bringing somebody from circulation to sign people up for library cards as well. Um, and then just this past weekend, the staff were at a CU Pride Fest. Um, they had a table there with the Champaign Public Library so that when they were signing people up for library cards, what ended up happening is you inevitably at the farmer's market will get somebody who lives in Champaign, of course, who can't get a library card with us. So it's nice to have both libraries together at the same time. Some of the other special events that we have this month, um, Elaine also mentioned the pop-up library, and on the right is an article that was in the News Gazette that uh, we've had a lot of great promotion um, over the past several months. And um, going into the month, and I should have mentioned this first, is that um, I was invited to be on CI Living to talk about National Library Card Sign-Up Month. And when Matt Metcalf and I were talking about the approach to this, he kind of thought it was going to be a little bit boring. And, he wanted to talk more about the mechanics of getting a library card, but I kind of talked to him about when I was growing up, when I was growing up, um, I grew up in Manhattan and there was a, um, a song that was on the radio and it was a promotional message that was talking about libraries in general. And it was a song that said, they have histories, they have mysteries, and for mothers, books are recipes. See, so movie show here, symphony is the latest, is the greatest, is the library. And this was the song that I said, went to my mother and I said, we have to go. And that's what led me to the library. When was this? 1967. Wow. Yes, 1967. But Elaine told me that she thinks that LeVar Burton, there's one of the vision rainbows that he yeah. may have done that song. Oh, really? I don't want to find that's it. That's great. I'll, I'll never forget this song. So, but... <laughs> But when I went to, to WCI, uh, to CI Living, the point of that is we talked about, I brought all the things that you could discover with your library card. So we talked about things like uh, what's coming up in the collection, the science kits, the guitars, the amps. We talked about music and vinyl and CDs and music online. And the whole table was full of things. And what ends up being, usually they do four minutes. The library had five minutes and 54 seconds of fame this time, which is really kind of nice that we had that exposure. So. Here's our grand opening of the Bee and Butterfly Garden, and I want to encourage everybody to come to this. Um, the Little Free Library is in the upper left-hand corner. That, of course, is not on any stand yet. Um, that was built by the children of the 2016 construction camp of the Urbana Park District, which uh, I think all the children are coming for the event as well. So uh, on the upper right, we have all of the staff that were um, involved in planting the garden. And so we're looking very much forward to this one. But these are the types of events that we're trying to reach out to the community to let them know about the great things that we're doing. So they'll want to come here and they'll want to get a library card and check out materials. This is something that we're trying. September 27th at 7.30 a.m., uh, we're working with the Business and Breakfast of the Urbana Business Association. We're presenting a breakfast for business owners. And they want to do it on Cherry Alley. And that is one of the areas where we wanted to approach some of the business areas and business uh, members in town to talk about what the library can offer for them, but also for their clients as well. So um, you're all invited to that as well. It's open to the community. It's a great day. Are you getting the tent? I'm just uh, our, our interesting weather that we've had lately. <laughs> well, I'm a backup plan. We're going to do it out inside. So Let's put it that way. They wanted to do it outside. Yeah, I mean, it's great. I, I kind of said the same thing. They wanted to do it outside. And it, it, it so. could be such a perfect fall day. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it could be all over. Or not. Yes, exactly. And this one, uh, the third annual Immigrant Welcome Award Ceremony. That is um, a program that's going to celebrate the diverse nature of our community. There will be music, food, crafts for children, speakers um, about immigration in Champaign County, um, an award ceremony which will honor those, who, those individuals and organizations that have created a welcoming atmosphere for immigrants in Champaign County. And, Ha will be Ha Ho is getting an award. So I encourage you to come to that as well. Is so, that here? 
It is here okay. at the library, yes. Mm -hmm. It's 1 to 4.30 p.m., I believe. So. They used to have food for that. Can people bring food here? Uh, food. So as you go out into the community, we encourage you to encourage and to have people come and sign up for your library card. And later tonight, we're going to ask you to show us your library card. <laughs> <laughs> what time is that camp again? 1 30? Um, what did I, I say? I don't know. 1 to 4 1 to 4 30, I think, is right. Yes. Any questions? The amount of programming is just amazing to me. I mean, when I put down coming to the immigration ceremony, I'm coming to a music drumming thing earlier in the morning. I mean, it's like so much already. <laughs> so that's good. A good thing. Yes, exactly. 
So that's where we are with that. Um, for the HVAC proposal. Let's back up. Have you started the paperwork for the bids? Oh, no. no we just, no. this only happened yesterday. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, yes. Just, I'm not sure I'm clear on that. So just by asking them to itemize their um, estimate, that's what we would put for you. That was the only change in the proposal. The part that made it go over was not the itemization, I believe, but the fact that we said before, tell us how what it would cost to rebuild the porch, to take it apart and put it back together. We said, let's get a quote for that, but what if we just scrapped the porch and built it from scratch to replace the porch versus, because we don't know what the price would be. That is not our desire to do that, but it seems like something that would be good to know. So it raised the, the cost of the bid for the work to evaluate it. Well, so we're asking for two different things. If we replace it, we replace it with, we have to replace it with historically accurate detail and everything, right? I mean, somewhat. We, that would be our intention. Is there a regulation? I imagine that would be cheaper. Is there any kind of city ordinance that would make, mandate certain historic, uh, I mean, I don't know, I'm just asking. No. Okay. But we are interested in having it be the, it's a yeah. 1918 building, like, we yeah. love the look, and our community loves the look. Right, and just talking about one of the mandates. I wonder if, for things like that, where it's really kind of ballpark, at least initially, you know, would it be way more to replace this, or it's about the same, or could it be cheaper? Mm -hmm. um, whether that could be done informally with just some friend who's a contractor, rather than, you know, somebody who knows about that sort of stuff, might just be able to say, don't even bother to ask, that's going to be way more. Can we say we just got this information, so we're going to, we want to pull things together to give you here, and we can maybe have that conversation as well. Just generally, these uh, quotes are expensive. And, um, mm -hmm. It's sort of shocking, expensive, actually, given some of the uh, quality of it, uh, what goes into making it. So. Mm -hmm. well, there'll be uh, contingencies in there, contingencies on contingencies, too. Yeah. And that's that's going to be unknown. No, 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 I don't mean just. The, the dollar value for the work is expensive. I mean, the amount they charge you for giving a quote, we're giving a quote, is it's very mm high. -hmm. The RFP, who's actually going to prepare it? Is it the city engineers or would that be us? It would have to be us, but they have examples. So again, we'll look at the different elements, and if we need to come back to you with a, something for next month, we will, we will do that, whether it's you know what, we're going to go with this lower bid from before, it was $9,400, that doesn't need to go in board, we're going to move ahead and not ask for the second element of it, or we're going to go out for an RFP and you just take a look at it. If it was rebuilt from scratch, would it need a ramp? Does it, does it have a ramp now? It does not have a ramp. That is a good question, gentlemen. And I'm, I'm not saying it's, it could be a good thing to put it in a ramp, whether we need to rebuild it or not. Mm -hmm. But maybe not. I mean, Probably high to go for a ramp. Yeah, probably probably there, just down there. The other door is close to the parking lot anyway. So, yeah. But if it was rebuilt, it might be That is a good question. I'm glad you raised that because that is the first time someone said that though. <coughs> okay, you started the next one. Yes. <laughs> um, for the HVAC system. Yes. After our meeting last month, where Dan was here and Henman was also here. Uh, Celeste, um, Vince um, Gustafson from the city, who's the operations manager, and I, we had a conference call with him on um, August 17th. And we started the conversation by just kind of asking them what their impressions were of the meeting. And they talked, they, they remarked about how um, very thoughtful conversation and thing, and then they started talking about the different ways that they could revise the proposal to accomplish what we wanted to accomplish. And we talked a lot about the controls and the setbacks, 
We talked about the efficiency of the Cleaver Brook spoiler, which there was a question about that, that whether it truly was 93% efficient. When we talked about the options for the archives, because in reality, as it ended up, we wanted to just do the one storage room as opposed to it being the entire archives. And um, there, so they, they came back to us with something that we'll go ahead and add this, we'll go ahead and add this, we'll go ahead and add this. And then we did get something, but there's still some, it's not quite right yet. I sent an email to them last night because there's conflicting information that they're giving us. There's no cost estimates in certain areas. And there are some places where there just needs to be some clarifications. So it went back to them another time saying, we need more information. So it's not quite, it's not ready yet. So I was fairly discon, not that I didn't really know what I'm doing about this stuff, but just for the first time listening, I was fairly discontented with their presentation last time. Because there were a number of points that sort of reading the efficiency of the boiler off some plate, where obviously that wasn't really the right answer. The report not mentioned, we do have two boilers now, not one, which is a you know, major right. difference in terms right. of making exactly. the future plans and so on, that, you know, other relatively trivial things. Um, so, I want to propose something for people to think about, which is that the, they, they did say that the AC system is likely to need replacement 10, 12 years, something, something like that. And that's the big expense, bigger than boilers. Um, the standard sort of air exchange systems are very inefficient compared to ground exchange systems. So, and the thing about ground exchange systems is that they uh, are also highly efficient and ecologically sound heaters, except in, well, if you make them big enough in all of it, but um, if you make them kind of small and boost them with the boiler, Really cold weather. So, what I'm saying is, we had some discussion where we act as if, well, we're going to get some nice boilers and look for ones that can be expanded, you know, modular, and just keep piling up boilers if the building gets bigger in about 10 years. But I think that we should have a different approach, which is to do what we have to do for the time being to replace at least one building. Um, but not be thinking, okay, we'll just kind of follow our nose and be looking for expansion along the path we're following. But instead of be assuming that 10, 12 years from now we're going to change systems and not want to put too much into what's basically very old and uh, inefficient technology. Do, do what we have to do, but not sort of be thinking, okay, this is what we're going to be expanding along these lines, but it is so generally minimized the expenses. I, I don't you know, that's not a, a, something that obviously everybody would necessarily agree with. I kind of came away from the whole thing saying that I dealt with a group felt modularly and modules we can handle it financially better. Is that not part of that discussion? Not necessarily. Can I speak to both points? Yeah. Yeah. So yes, the modular, the way they're, the way kids these days put them in, is that you can <coughs> replace the one, uh, the one, here, sorry, uh, boiler, with two smaller ones, so that one failed, we still have the other one, as opposed to the the one, and then the other one will have three but two, like, half size each. When we talked about the archives and the potential expansion and a future expansion of the building, let's say, if that were to come to pass, they were talking about, well, would you want to just get a bigger unit now? And the answer is no, you don't. We're going to right size for the building we have now. We're going to look to the future and determine in the future what that needs to be. Because when you, if you're starting with a fresh expansion, you have different options than you're right. We're in this building. It's Ducted for the system that we have now. So it is our intention, if you agree with this, is to 
right size for the current building. Pay only for what we need for the current building to make it appropriate, but not to overbuy. Right. And the modularity allows us in the future that if we do expand and want to stick with the same kind of forced air system, that we could do that, you buy another another set of things. But if we wanted to go a different path. Forced force air is in common, so that doesn't even go. Okay, so I'm sorry, yeah. I used the wrong word. But well, well, it, which is important because it's tearing things up less. Uh, yes. yes, so that, that we would um, evaluate in new construction expansion with, we would evaluate the lay of the land at that time, starting fresh for that, that section. So, and another question, which is, um, they picked the figure of five-year payback for deciding whether, they which, did. which sounded, um, Crazy uh, to just sit down, calculator, and think of interest rates and so on, um, inflation rates, etc. Uh, if there was a way of, of significantly cutting the uh, annual expenses, but it would require you know more capital expense. May I please have your attention? The Urbana Free Library will close in 30 minutes. Patrons who wish to apply for or renew library cards should come to the circulation desk in the next 15 minutes. What's the deal with um, bonds? Uh, and, um, very good. If, 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 you know, you say you need a whatever, $300,000 bond issue, but basically we're going to Taxpayers have to come with almost nothing to maybe make, you know, because we won't be asking for as much, um, you know, gas and shit. But I, I don't know how that works. There are companies that actually look at this exact thing, and we, the city is looking at potentially working with the company to help evaluate. They have more energy. Uh, they have more energy outlay in that they have a fleet of cars, for example. So they need to, they are looking at the ways to make the fleet of cars more efficient, as well as HVAC, which we all have in common. So the city is looking at evaluating current expenditures on utilities and such versus taking your, your you know what you would budget for gas every year and putting that towards capital expenditures for a more efficient system. Yes, we are actually looking at that right now. So we're, we're trying to approach this from different ways. And the DCEO grants are now out again, the Library Live and Learn grant that could help pay for some large project, which Kathy applied for last year for us and we didn't receive, but we have a better feeling now what to ask for, so we can apply again. So there are other opportunities for funding that might not just be from the Urbana citizenry. Or as you suggest, um, there's a potential for bonding through the city. The city's allowed to, to, to bond for a certain amount as well for a few years. So. We do have different options, and we're trying to see what, what would make sense. And I think that there's a natural long-term time scale for this planning, which is roughly the time scale to replace the AC. Because that'll be, that'll be the point where it's going to be really expensive anyway, and new incremental cost. Then there's the At that point, it's work too, so. So there was this fascinating article in the paper about uh, the increase in um, license insurance, <laughs> insurance companies requiring roof inspections and that kind of thing. Is that the kind of thing that might affect us? It's only the changing insurance companies is what the well, bottom line to that seemed to be. I got the impression it was just, it was a insurance industry Move. thing going on that now, yeah. and that basically they're telling one of the council members that you have to replace your roof or else you can't insure your... And he's changing um, insurance he's changing. Yeah. Right. If you leave your insurance alone, it sounds like you're okay. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. That's the next step. But it, I'm just saying it's an issue and it may be something, in, if you're talking about roofs, that um, you might look into what your insurance policy covers. The state has a list of things that they're required to do every single year. I'm wondering what is the fire 
dollars might be every two years. Do we pay? I'm sorry, I should know. Do we pay insurance for the building? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Buildings. We're all covered. It was really, really scary. Good. I was expecting something in the mail for the minute I read that the next day. So. <laughs> Are we part of city wide insurance pool? Health insurance, yes. Uh, property and casualty, yeah, no. Property casualty, no? We do that in Delta. You're afraid of how you do it. I'm sorry, what happened? I wasn't talking about the fire. I would have to pull the fire. It depends on the kind of insurance you're talking about, so I... I but we have been in the past. Well, sure, and this yeah. year you... So last year, it was a three-year uh, three offer for keeping the price the same. Mm -hmm. And so you saw the contract then, and I had it again, and you approved it again this year. And you would, anyone wants to see the insurance policy, you're welcome to. And I would be happy to pull the deductibles for you, because I, I have a summer sheet, I just don't know. Okay. Summer sheet, fine. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, let's see. Any other questions? Let's move along and give Bill an opportunity here to tell us about the advocacy. Okay, I'm to talk about the chapter 12 and the custody facts about what most of us got. Um, I'll just go through it kind of quick and then we can see if we have any particular questions or anything. Um, basically, advocacy. And I also had um, Celeste print out the one-page thing. So whenever you go talk to a legislator or, or a government person, it's always good to have one page in your hand because they don't like to read more than one page and leave it with them. And then email it to them when you get back because they probably have lost it by then. <laughs> but it gives them something to write on. And it gives them, if you have your card, you staple your card to it. It gives them something concrete. Sometimes you don't get to talk directly to the representative, especially in, in Washington. You might talk to, uh, uh, you know, one of their aides or something, and then so you may pass that on to the representatives usually, and, and we'll have some comments and maybe some writing on it. So it's always good to leave something physical in the office. So that's why we have one page to look at today. It does have some good bullet points on it as far as um, the top ten kind of tips about what to do when you're when you're talking with a public official. Um, but the chapter covers a little bit more than just that. It talks about cultivating relationships beforehand so that when an issue comes up, you, you, um, they'll already know you, hopefully, and you'll be able to just say, yeah, remember me? Remember Scott? Scott Bennett was one that served with us on our, on our board here. Now he's in the state senate. So just say, remember me? I served with the library board with you. And, now we need a new air conditioner, and we're looking at the DCO grants. And do you have a staff member that can help us get through that process, or you know whatever it takes? Mm -hmm. um, but also, I think with uh, uh, just advocacy in general, um, it's more than just public officials. It's um, you know, like the work we do at the school district and park district. It's good to talk that up with the community, so the community knows that we're more involved. And, um, if the park district issue or school district issue comes up and they know that, that we're, we work with them and you know it just it helps to have more knowledge out there, it helps to generate contributions I guess once we get our um, development person on board. Um, so I guess as far as this chapter goes, it's good reading. There's a couple things in the no-nos I thought were pretty good. It's things not to do. Um, that I've noticed as a um, city council, don't deluge somebody with a lot of automated stuff because um, it's easy to set up an email filter and filter it out, and then you end up <laughs> missing things that might be important. Um, don't be too wordy and unfocused. Um, you know, one page is good, um, and and try to um, try to make a. Maybe a personal connection or a story they can relate to. Um, also, try to identify common goals. So, if you know that the city has a goal as far as, um, um, let's see, I'm go down a couple of things. city or state, might be like early childhood education, adult literacy, workforce development. Those are things we do. We all do at the library, um, or even downtown. Uh, Development or business opportunities. We bring a thousand people a day into downtown. Basically, it's 
or your account for 30 some thousand, yeah, about 30,000 a month. So, you know, that's something to talk about is then we do all these programming and stuff, all this programming. So things like that um, kind of figure out what the common goals are and what they might relate to. Um, as far as who you should talk to, county board, um, we all have different county board members probably, or hopefully we cover most of the county board, or not really, most of the ones that represent their banner part, but that's, that's still like three or four. Um, we have two state representatives, don't forget about Chad Hayes, even though he's a Republican. <laughs> he covers all of uh, Stone Creek and uh, South of the South Urbana and Champaign. That, that district wraps around and covers Vermillion County. But um, you know, it always helps to, to talk to everybody that, that you have represent, representation from. Um, Scott Bennett, our state senators, Chad Hayes, uh, and um, Carol, Carol Ammons, as you couldn't say here, um, our representatives and Senators in the U.S. We probably don't do too much with the U.S. Rep, but, um, most of it's probably going to be state issues. So on the Illinois Library Association site, there's um, also that's where this came from. But they also have um, usually a one pager on both the top state issues and the top federal issue, top federal issues that you can refer to, and they have um, bill numbers on them, so you can look at those. Right now, it's between, it's after the regular session, before the veto session, so probably nothing will come up in the veto session. Um, that I know of, I think anything that's been proposed is either stuck in Rules Committee or didn't get out of Rules Committee, or, or, or got to a, a, a different committee and didn't get out of that committee. Um, but if there was something that the governor might have it would come back. I think once this year there were a couple of um, tax things like tax caps, EAD sort of things. Some other things that come up that are related to library might be privacy issues, um, First Amendment issues, um, but mostly probably revenue sort of things. Um, I think that's about all I can think of. Any, any comments or questions? So that's the meeting that we went to in Burlington. Really, is this, um, and is that held annually? They move it around, and I'm not sure. Last year was the first one in Mid Central Illinois. We, I worked with Sue Franson at the Illinois Library on campus there, and this year we will be doing it again. And Brian Chase at the Normal Public Library is going to help up there as well. So it's an opportunity to go to this ILA event. We invite our legislators. Uh, federal and state, and to see which we are able to come. People from ILA talk about issues facing libraries so that the legislators learn about it. We get to have lunch with them and talk with them and talk about your personal experiences. And it, it was a really great event. And so we will be having it again. It's March 3rd okay, at the normal right. Marriott. And it's legislative days, is that what you call it? It'll be a lot of legislative days. Legislative days, sometimes they call it lobby day or something. The only and problem about it is some of the legislators do not spend much time with us. They blow in, blow off, and blow out. But it, it is an opportunity. And I think we have had a wonderful, because we've ran a lot of city council through this board, and we've got Scott Bennett at any time. My best is the September 24th is a shredding paper, and that was coming directly from Scott. He got it arranged. There's a shredding day on the 24th uh, in the Weaver parking lot immediately to our west, which is Jefferson Pimpolo, so uses parking lot again, and you can bring in your boxes of things to be shredded. It's also a mini recycling fair, and if you look on the website, you can see what, not TVs, don't bring them to the TV, but there are a number of things you can bring in, and people will collect them and make sure they get to different recycling spots. Nice. Nice. And that was a board member request. Could we be done in one year? And Chris said, could we do it again? And so when you see needs in the community, if you let us know, we'll do our best to make it happen. And Scott went to AT&T and got it. Because AT&T's paying. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 How are they important? Well, they just charge. Yeah. Well, 